Uh, we weren't sure exactly how this would work out, but I do have a better idea now of how many. Uh, we had 60 people, uh, reg approximately 60 people register for uh, coming this morning. Uh, the two pew spacing, uh, one, use one, skip two, that's because of the I can't get the six feet distance if we only skip one pew. So uh, skipping two pews gives us seven feet between the person uh, in front of you if there's somebody sitting in front of you. Uh, but we are very glad that you're able to be here with us today. And who knows, the government might change all their guidelines this week and uh, we'll have to see what happens if they do that. So, but we'd encourage you to uh, try to, uh, if there's room you know, horizontally to allow somebody else to sit in the row you're at, if they're trying to find a place, uh, just let them do that. Uh, greatly appreciate that. And then family members all try to sit close together. Uh, Pete and Rich have been together all the time, so I just told them they're family. Uh, so they're they're sitting they're sitting together <laughs> for that. Uh, Father, we're so thankful we can gather together in the house of the Lord to uh, to worship you. We claim the promise that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst. And we pray, Father, that you would meet with us today and you'd bless us from the ministry of the Word of God uh, in song as well as the preached Word. We pray, Father, that you would uh, fill us uh, with your Spirit for this purpose and that you might be honored and glorified in all that is said and done today in this service. If there's anyone still coming who is planning to come today, we pray that you would keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. This time, Andrew will come and lead us in a couple of hymns. I invite you to stand as we sing God of Our Fathers. The words will be projected. Obviously, we have no hymnals right now. So please direct your attention to the screen. God of our fathers, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty all the starry band of shining worlds in splendor through the skies, our grateful songs before thy throne. divine hath led us in the past. In this free land by thee our lot is cast. Be thou our ruler, guardian, guide, and stay. Pestilence. Be thy strong arm, our ever sure defense. Thy true religion in our hearts increase. Thy bounteous goodness nourish us in peace. Re Refresh thy people on their toilsome way. Lead us from night to never-ending day. Fill all our lives with love and grace divine. And glory, Lord, and praise be ever Please be seated. I invite you now to sing with me, O Beautiful for Spacious Skies. O beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God 
God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O beautiful for pilgrim feet whose stern impassioned stress author of fair for freedom beat across the wilderness america america god mend thine every flaw confirm thy soul in self-control thy liberty in law oh beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life america america may god thy gold refine till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea thank you andrew so how many of you are going to admit you sang when you're at home with a hand okay okay we had one person said the rest of their family thought they were crazy uh, for, for doing that, but they sang it. They sang at home anyway, uh, so we're glad that you did as well. It, uh, you're gonna have to be a little patient with me. It's gonna take me some adjustments to get back to used to having people out here like this. Uh, for the last several months, I've had a computer sitting right there looking at myself uh, whenever I've been uh, teaching your lessons and uh, doing the Word of God. But we're so thankful for uh, Pastor Troy and Matt Hubert and Andrew for the huge help that they've been. Uh, making the live stream possible. We are continuing to live stream. Uh, that's been one of our goals the whole time because we knew a number of people would not be coming out immediately and we want them to be able to get the uh, ministry of the Word of God uh, at home either on YouTube uh, or Facebook. For those that are watching from home, if you have problems with the YouTube feed, jump over to the website. If you have trouble with the website, jump over to the YouTube feed. Uh, sometimes we have no idea what goes wrong with one or the other. Uh, sometimes we can find out later in the afternoon, but sometimes we never find out. Um, and then um, the messages are posted later in the afternoon, certainly before 6 o'clock. Pastor Troy has to do his thing and uh, get everything ready, and we're so thankful that he's been taping, making a copy as we broadcast on his computer because one week we had a problem with the actual feed, and if we hadn't have been doing that, we wouldn't have been able to get the message on the, on the uh, website at all for that. Uh, we also want to thank um, Andrew and uh, Michael um, LaBelle, uh, if you notice, the shrubs have been trimmed, the flower beds have been cleaned. Uh, we want to thank them for all the work that they did. That came out and did that on two different days. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, Ama came and did the decorations uh, this week, and so we're thankful for uh, what she has done uh, for that. Um, uh, Joe, you're going to be away next week, right? So I, do, I need a doorman for next week. So if anybody wants to volunteer to be a doorman in the house of the Lord, uh, the Bible verses, I'd rather be a doorman in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So if you want to be a doorman and really get some uh, wonderful service for the Lord, I need a volunteer. We're trying to cut down on as many people touching the doorknob as possible. So if we can have one person do that, that's a, that's a tremendous help. Uh, but we will, uh, Ashley, if, every time she's here, we'll be taking your temperature uh, as you come in the door or outside the door, wherever she thinks it's best to do that. Uh, so we appreciate her help in that as well. 
Uh, we do have a missionary committee meeting in this room uh, after the morning service. Uh, someone asked me, so what do I do with my family while I'm waiting for my, per, uh, my spouse who's on the missionary committee meeting? I said, you can go anywhere in a church. Just stay six feet away from everybody else. <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's the thing we need you to do. Uh, so for that, we appreciate that. Uh, also, there is a quarterly business meeting this Wednesday night. Quarterly business meeting this Wednesday night. We'll be in here. Again, social spacing. Uh, I don't think we'll have any problems uh, for doing all of that. So... Is there any other announcements anybody needs to share? Okay. Yes. The mission is Tuesday night for the men. So if you're going to go to the Sunday breakfast mission, uh, Rich thinks we're the first church to resume our ministry down there. Is that what you told me earlier? Uh, so contact Rich if you're uh, willing to go down there and serve there at the Sunday breakfast mission. Um, that um, I don't know if all the families have been notified yet, but uh, the camp, Pinwood Bible Camp, had to make a very difficult decision yesterday. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the Secretary of Health for the Department of Health of Pennsylvania issued new guidelines for masks uh, early on in the week. And that kind of, they, they can't figure out how to implement those new guidelines and have camp at the same time. So the grade school kids will not be going to camp this week. They're still holding out, hoping all that gets resolved. Uh, for the teen camp, which is the following week. So be much in prayer for, for Byron uh, and the family. That's a huge, huge disappointment for them. It's a huge disappointment for all the children that were going to be going to camp. Uh, some camps have completely shut down for the whole summer. Uh, so it, it's a, it, they need grace and, and mercy from the Lord. Uh, Andrew? Please sing with me now. My country, tis of thee. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. My native country, the land of the noble free, thy name I love. I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and templed hills, my heart with rapture thrills like that above. Let music swell the breeze and ring from all the trees, sweet freedom song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that breathe partake, let rocks their silence break, the sound prolong. Our fathers, God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. At this time, our special music is by Billy Massey. Isn't this great being back in the Lord's house? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I believe in God and always will. And uh, our country's been going through a lot lately. And I still believe in America. I believe in America, yes, America, I believe in you, I believe in old glory, I believe in the red, white, and blue, yes, I still believe in America. You're still the land of the free. 
I'm still thrilled to have old glory fly proudly over me. America, America of thee I'll proudly sing. Yes, I still believe in America. Long let this freedom ring. From the oceans to the mountains, from the valleys to the sea, in God we trust for our freedom. He is our hope of liberty. Let them say what they want about America. Let them laugh and have their fun. But for me, there's no place like the USA. After all that's said and done, America, America, of thee I'll proudly sing. Yes, I still believe in America. Long let this freedom ring. America, America, of thee I'll proudly sing. Yes, I still believe in America. Long let this freedom ring. Billy volunteered yesterday. We were trying to get a quartet together to sing this morning, uh, but this didn't work out for rehearsals for the quartet to work out. So then Billy contacted me and said, do we have anybody? And I said, no. So he got back and said he volunteered. So we're thankful for his willingness to participate in that. Uh, many of you have been praying for Judy. Uh, Judy is making progress. They still don't know exactly why she got sick, uh, but she is making progress. Uh, so if you want to talk to her sometime, I'm sure she would appreciate that uh, to give her a phone call. Uh, and so but please continue to remember her in your prayers. Uh, Kathy Abbott. Um, was kind of secondarily possibly exposed to COVID. Uh, so she's self-quarantining for a couple of weeks. Uh, she uh, is having a test done Tuesday, but she has no symptoms whatsoever. She's feeling great. Uh, so please continue to remember her in your prayers uh, as well. Uh, Barbara Pusey as well is doing well. She ne even though she tested positive, she never showed any signs uh, of having uh, COVID as well. So continue to remember, especially our, uh, the people on the prayer list that uh, work with the uh, medical field and the uh, police departments, the EMTs and things of that nature. Uh, the, you know, it's up and down. Pennsylvania's high one day, low, low, a little normal or not today. I know a lot of you are frustrated about different statistics that you see. The biggest statistic that can tell you what's really going on is how full are the ICUs and what are the hospitalizations. All the other statistics, one state does it one way, another state does it another way. There's some confusion about that. But the number of hospital beds that are full, the ICU capacity, you can't fudge those. Uh, so that's pretty much the best way if you're trying to look for any statistics to give you an idea of what's really going on. Uh, Father, we are so thankful that we are privileged to live uh, in the United States of America. We're thankful, Lord, that we've been able to gather together to one with another today in the house of the Lord to celebrate the birth of our nation and the freedoms that you have given to us through this wonderful nation. Lord, we are not a perfect nation. We confess that. We, Lord, we are a sinful nation. And yet, Lord, we are founded on biblical principles. Yes, there are some who are trying to 
uh, destroy those foundations. But Lord, we pray that you would help us to elect uh, men and women into uh, the elected uh, offices that will hold true to the founding principles of the founding fathers of this nation built upon the word of God. Lord, we need wisdom. We need discernment. We need grace. We pray for our president and his advisors that you would give them wisdom. We pray, Lord, as well for our governors and for the mayors of our cities and our town and the, the uh, councilmen and women of our townships and, and boroughs. We pray, Lord, for wisdom that they would seek first your wisdom regarding these matters. Lord, we pray that you would help us as a nation to repent and to turn to you and that you would bring healing to our land and that your people would pray and seek your face regarding uh, repentance and regarding righteousness and regarding truth. We pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts from the word of God today. We pray, Father, that you would change our lives and mold us to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for Judy, that you continue to help her to get stronger every day, Lord. We pray for Kathy, that you keep her safe, Lord, and free from this COVID, uh, even as she quarantines. There'd be no problem. We do pray, Father, for Barbara, to continue to keep her safe there in the nursing home. And we pray for our first responders, Lord, and for our, our nurses and our uh, EMTs and for our ER personnel and for the police officers, that you would keep them safe, Lord. We pray, Father, that you'd help us to have a positive witness in our community and on the Internet and, and within our families and on the telephone and in our texting, Lord, that we would point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We do pray for the Sunday breakfast mission. We ask, Lord, that you would bless their ministry there with the homeless there in Wilmington. We pray that you'd bless our team that will be going down Tuesday. We pray, Father, also for Pinwood Bible Camp. Lord, we know how disappointed they are that they've had to cancel the children's ministry for this week. We pray, Lord, that something would work out, that they might be able to have the camp for the teens next week and the other camps, Lord, as they're struggling to figure out how to implement the safety protocols established by the Pennsylvania Department of Health. And now, Lord, we pray for ourselves. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts from the word of God. We ask that you would mold us to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, convict us if there's the need to be convicted of sin and, and of wickedness and of unrighteousness in our hearts and help us to acknowledge that and confess it and forsake it before you. We pray for wisdom, Lord, how to minister to your people and to continue through this time. And we pray, Lord, that soon it would be all over. We might be able to be back to our regular ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. We do ask for your prayer for our Bible school. Bible school staff, we're uh, doing a different approach this summer uh, because of all the restrictions on the, uh, from the Department of Health. Um, we're going to do a virtual Bible school. At some point, we will be asking the parents to enroll for the virtual Bible school. And you say, well, why do they need to enroll for the virtual Bible school? That's because we want to drop off crafts at the house. We want to drop off the worksheets that the children will be able to participate in. We want to drop off the memory verses, but everything will be uh, pre-taped. Everything will be organized, and then they'll be broadcast at a certain point, and then it will be posted later. So if some, for some reason uh, you can't make it on Tuesday night uh, with, you, with your children, your grandchildren, you can watch it Wednesday sometime uh, and then pick it up on, on, on Wednesday night. So pray for that. Uh, that is a great uh, undertaking. Uh, last week, we looked at the concept from Matthew 23, uh, 23 regarding justice, mercy, and faith or faithfulness. Uh, this week, I kind of want to dovetail with that, with the aspect of equality in the eyes of God. Um, Congress read for the first time the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. And I'm just going to read the first part of that to you. I would encourage you to sit down sometime and read the entire document. It is not that long. But a lot of people struggle with, well, should they have done this? And why did they do this? The reasons for it are stipulated in the document itself. And so if you have not read it recently, I'd encourage you to take the time to read it again. And if you've never read it, I'd take your time to take you to read it. You can get it very easily. It's, it's on the Internet in multiple locations, but it is on the archives. If you go to archives.gov, uh, you'll find it there as well. And here's what the beginning of it says. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another 
and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature, and listen carefully, nature's God, entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I want to ask you a question. When you hear the words that all men are created equal, what do you think of? What does that bring to your mind? The second question is, what do you think Thomas Jefferson meant by those words? And obviously, the other men who eventually signed the Declaration. Now, you do realize that there was a, there was a process, there was a committee. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was assigned to do the draft. Then the committee went over the draft. And then that final draft got submitted to the Congress. And then they made additional changes, which we'll share with you in just a moment. So what do they think the Founding Fathers actually meant when they said all men are created equal? Some could argue, though it would be a grammatical argument, whether or not they meant that when they followed by saying that all men are endowed with certain unalienable rights by the Creator, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So some could argue that when they say all men are created equal, all men are created equal in the sense that they are endowed by their Creator with these unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, if you know anything about American history, you understand that there was a huge compromise made for the founding of this country because slavery was an issue even before the Declaration of Independence was written. And because they were trying to form a, a unified government, they made a compromise over slavery. And that compromise was exemplified in many, many uh, acts of Congress uh, following down all the way through, which eventually resulted in the Civil War, uh, or as the southern states look at it, the War of Northern Aggression. Uh, either way you want to look at it, there was a great civil war, and uh, that settled the issue of slavery. But you do realize that based on if you knew something about uh, the, the, uh, tenth, the tenth day that was celebrated in, in June, that it took another two years for some people in Texas to find out that they were emancipated. That some people did not find for another two years that they were free from their slave owners. And so then we've had the problems with laws that were passed that uh, su suspended the voting rights of African Americans. And then we had all these other laws that constantly tried to uh, kind of put people with, uh, and, and, and prevent them from being able to vote. Now, you under also have to understand something. When they said all men are created equal, they didn't mean women. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. They didn't mean Native Americans. They didn't mean African Americans. They only meant those men who were in the voting power at that time. But the document was so well worded that it gave us the foundation to, ex to eventually grant the voting rights to ladies and women and to African Americans and to uh, Native Americans and to others. And so there has been an evolution in the understanding of what it actually meant to when it says all men are created equal. Now, I kind of suspect, but this is just a suspicion, that Thomas Jefferson knew that he was doing something that would eventually take place. You know, there's sometimes men understand that they have to make compromises to get something done in the, in the short term, but it's worded in such a way that allows for a, another understanding of that down the road. But I'd like us this morning not to so much consider what the Founding Fathers meant, but what does God mean? I mean, after all, we are Christians. We are people of God's book. We are people who are supposed to make our decisions based on the principles found in the Word of God. We are people who are supposed to make our decisions based on what God says we need to do, how God says we need to think, and those things of that nature. So, with time allowing, Lord willing, we're going to look at four things that I believe the Bible teaches regarding 
all men are created equal. Number one, people are equal in the eyes of God regarding their worth because of creation. Number two, people are equal in the eyes of God regarding the law. Number three, people are equal in the eyes of God regarding their sinfulness and their need for a Savior. And number four, people are equal in the eyes of God regarding the gospel call. For the scripture says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. First, people are equal in the eyes of God with regards to their value and their dignity because all men are created in the image of God. Thomas Jefferson's earliest draft said this, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, and here's the difference, with inherent and inalienable rights. Not unalienable rights, but inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was his original part of his earlier draft. Well, once the committee got a hold of it, once the Congress got a hold of it, they changed those a few words there where it says with inherent and inalienable rights simply to unalienable rights. Now, the modern version of unalienable is the word inalienable. inalienable. So it's just a matter of spelling. And, and believe it or not, they debated extensively whether it was supposed to be U N inalienable or I N inalienable. And if you've ever been to certain uh, organizations that's uh, been dealing with writing of constitutions, you'll find that uh, that's the case in those situations as well. We understand that the words unalienable cannot be surrendered. The word inalienable means that it, these rights cannot be surrendered. They cannot be alienated from you. They cannot be transferred from you, for, for, from any person, because the inalienable rights are given to us, not by our government, but by God himself. And that's the founding principle upon which the founding fathers understood, and that principle is found in the Bible. And that's why they based that principle on the Bible. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at several passages as we go through the scriptures this morning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. The word of God says, so God created man. God created man. That, that, word, that phrase is repeated many times in the Bible. There can be no misunderstanding. As far as the Bible is concerned, man did not evolve as far as the Bible is concerned, man was created uniquely on, a, on the sixth day as the, uh, as the supreme uh, manifestation of God's creation. God created man. He says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. And then he clarifies that. Male and female created he them. Now, the question is... What is this image? Well, theologians debate that issue. And if you go to an ordination council, you're going to find oftentimes that's a question that's asked the candidate uh, who's standing in front of all these pastors and sometimes uh, theolo theology professors and college professors. And they ask him, so please tell us, how is man created in the image of God? Well, I can tell you, based on my reading, nobody has a definitive answer on that. Many people say it's because man has emotion, intellect, and will. So if I hear a candidate say that, I say, do you have a dog? And if they say yes, I say, has your dog ever cried? Dog has emotions. You ever seen the videos on, on TV when, a, when, a, when, a, when the owner leaves the house for some dogs? They have anxiety attacks. That tells you that a dog has emotions. We had a, a dog pen. And that dog pen was about from here to that wall right there, the near wall. Um, it was supposed to be an escape-proof dog pen. And uh, so uh, when we put it together, we put mesh on the ground. We buried the mesh. Uh, I forget how many inches under the ground. We put poles right along here. So the poles went through the mesh. 
What that means is the dog can't dig out by getting right next to the fence. A dog on the outside trying to get in can't get in. Uh, uh, and you say, why would a dog want to get in? Well, if it's a female dog, they want to get in. So trying to get in to that. Uh, so we did that. And so then we also uh, had on the top of the wire, the mesh was bent in. That way the dog couldn't climb out and go over the fence because the mesh was bent in. My sister's daughter had a mutt. Uh, no offense, Kyung, it was part uh, Boston Terrier and part, part something else. I don't remember what the something else was. And this dog kept escaping from the dog-proof escape dog kennel. So I had to hide. And I found out that we had laid a piece of pipe on, across from one side of the kennel to the other side and across the doghouse. The dog, dog would jump up on the doghouse, jump up on top of the doghouse, walk this pipe over to the fence, lean over to the fence, lean against the fence, and squeeze between the two pieces of the fence. The dog obviously had intellect. So I then had to figure out how the dog was going to have to take the pipe off. I had to take over here and I had to mesh these two pieces of fence together. It was a smart dog. Dog still got out. Had to hide again and watch the dog. The only place in the whole place where the fence did not bend in was where the gate was. Because the gate had to open. And if the gate had that there, the dog would climb right there and go right over. I forget how I fixed that, but I did. So the dogs can have emotion. They can have intellect. You ever tried to take a bone from a dog? You will find out that a dog has a will. A dog has a will if you try to take that. So, since the Bible does not say that dogs are created in the image of God, I'm not sure that emotion, intellect, and will is the best definition of what that means. But even though theologians have not come up with the best answer yet, um, we know that the Bible makes it quite clear that in some way we are made uniquely in the image of God as opposed to dogs, cats, foxes, deer, and anything else that you might come across, and the rest of God's creation. All men are created equal, every man, woman, and child, because they bear the image of God. The value of a person is intrinsically tied to the fact that the person is created in the image of God. And this is why murder is wrong. This is why sin is, murder is a sin. Because every time a person murders someone else, they're striking at the image of God. This is why also the Bible teaches that you're never supposed to call anyone a moron or a fool. Because that person is, in, is created in the image of God. And when you call that person a moron or a fool, you're calling the image of God a moron or a fool. In Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, this is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created man. In his likeness of God made he him, male and female, created he them and blessed them and called their names Adam in the day where they were created. Again, all men are equal in that every man, woman, and child bears the likeness of God. The two, one, word, one passage uses the word image, the other passage uses the word likeness. They are different Hebrew words. In Job chapter 31, turn to Job chapter 31. I want you to see this one. This, was a, this is an interesting uh, passage. Uh, basically, if you find Psalm 1, you're pretty close to Job 31. So if you find Psalm 1, you're very close to Job 31. In our passage, Job is speaking. And Job is defending himself against the accusations of his friends. His friends have accused him of some hidden sin in his life, and that's why all these calamities have fallen upon him. And so in Job's answer, as to part of that, in chapter 31, verse 13, Job says these words, If I despise the cause of my male or female servants when they complain against me, what then shall I do when God rises up, when he punishes how shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? 
Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? Now, I don't know if that just hits you the way I hope it does. But Job is basically saying here, I need to treat my servants with dignity. I need to treat my servants with honor because the same God who created me created them. That's what Job is saying. And when he says when God rises, he's talking about the resurrection. Job is the first uh, book of the Bible that talks about the great resurrection. Job said, the worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. And Job knows that he will have to stand before God and give an account of God how he treats his servants. In our modern uh, vernacular, we would say supervisors, business owners, boss man. We're going to have to give an account to God how we treat those who work underneath us. Parents, we're going to have to give an account to those of how we treat our children, how we treat our neighbors, how we treat one another. Why? Because every man, woman, born, every man, woman, boy, and girl are created in the image and likeness of God. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse, 20, verse 2, it says, The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. While it is true that all men are not equally, equal economically, some people are rich and some people are poor. And Jesus said, you will have the poor with you always. Nevertheless, Jehovah God makes it quite clear that he is the maker of all men. And therefore, we have to understand we have all this in common and we need to treat one another with dignity. In Acts chapter 10, verse 28, Then he, Peter, said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with, with or go to one of another nation. So, in other words, it was Peter's understanding that he could not have a best friend who was a Gentile. That he could not eat with a Gentile. That he could not be a business partner with a Gentile. That was Peter's understanding and many of the Jewish people at that time. And so God was trying to teach Peter something very important. That the gospel was not just for the Jews. But that the gospel was for the entire world, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. And so God uh, sent down all these, in a vision, sent down all these unclean animals. And he said, Peter, arise, kill and eat. And Peter says, not so, Lord, for I've no, nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. Three times God did that. And after the third time, there was a knock at the door. And the knock at the door was a Gentile seeking the gospel. And here's what Peter says. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter understood and learned the lesson that God does not consider any person to be common or unclean. God does not look at us based on the, the skin tone that we have. God does not look at us based on the ethnicity that we have. God does not look at us based on the economic status that we have or the social status we have and says that this person is more important than this person because of their color or because of their economic status or because of their ethnicity. No, in the eyes of God, all men are created equal. All men have equal value. And if all men have equal value, then we need to treat all men equally. In Acts chapter 17, verse 22, Paul this time then Paul stood in the midst of, the, uh, of what the King James says, Mars Hill, and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made, listen carefully, from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. We have a wonderful book in our church library called One Blood. It's written to show that all men are created equal in the eyes of God regarding their value because we all can trace our ancestry back to Adam. 
And so because we all come from one blood, we need to understand that we all have equal value. Paul understood that people from every nation came from the same bloodline. O positive blood is O positive blood, whether it comes from a Caucasian, an African American, a Hispanic, a Native American, an Oriental, or a person from the Middle East. If you're dying on a, on a table and you need blood, you're not going to care what ethnicity that came from. You're just going to want O positive blood if that's what you need, or O negative blood if that's what you need, or whatever. See, it's not the ethnicity that matters. We all come from one blood. We also find that people are equal in the eyes of God regarding the law. And this is very important. Now, you need to understand, we have, we have what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. The word testament can be translated covenant. So you have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But what you need to understand is that the, in, in the Old Testament, you actually have many covenants. You have what is sometimes referred to as the Adamic Covenant or the, or the, or, or the Edenic Covenant that God made with Adam and Eve. Then you have the covenant that God made with Noah. And then you have the covenant that God made with Moses and the nation of Israel. Well, when we think of the term law or the Old Testament, mostly what we're normally thinking of is what we refer to as the Mosaic Covenant. And there are many aspects of the Mosaic Covenant which are unique to Israel because in Israel's government form from the very beginning, it was intended to be what we call a theocracy or a theonomy. God's rule through the way he set it up. Now, God told Moses that men was going to rebel, and so therefore he needed in the book of Deuteronomy to give the qualifications of a king. But if you remember that when God told Samuel that it was time to anoint Saul, that God told Samuel, Samuel, they have not rejected you as being their rejected you, but they have rejected me as being their king. And that and it says they wanted a king to be like all the other nations. And that was a big problem that they had. But we need to understand that in the eyes of God regarding law under the Mosaic Covenant, we are all equal in the eyes of God. Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defines equality as this. Justice according to natural law or right specifically, freedom from bias or favoritism. Something that is equitable. Now, did you notice how Webster defined that? Natural law. Do you remember what we read when we started reading the Declaration of Independence? Nature's law. Nature's God. Creator. See? It didn't actually use the word God, but it has that, that implication. It's a, it's a, a, a synonym. It continues. E equity. A system of law originating in the English chancery. I think it actually originated in the Bible. And comprising a settled or formal body of legal and procedural rules and doctrines that supplement, aid, or override common and statute law and are designed to protect rights and enforce duties fixed by the substantive law. So, in other words, equity under the law is found in the nature of God and that's why the founding father said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among which are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness so with regards to the political law of israel and i'm going to skip some sections here because of time the civil law of israel here's what it says leviticus 24:17 Whoever kills any man shall surely be put to death. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, animal for animal. If a man causes disfiguration of his neighbor, and as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has caused disfigurements of a man, so shall it be done to him. And whosoever kills an animal shall restore it. But whosoever kills a man shall be put to death. You shall have the same law, notice carefully, for the stranger and for the one from your own country. Why? For I am the Lord your God. So God says when it came to the civil laws of implementing right from wrong and justice, doesn't matter whether they're a stranger, and that's what the word we would use there would be an, a resident alien, or 
a person who was born in the nation of Israel. It doesn't matter. He says it is the same standard of justice. Now, if you were listening carefully, you heard this one word or this one phrase that is probably one of the most abused and misunderstood and maligned phrases of the entire Bible. It said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But what you didn't understand is that the context of this passage is written to judges. I'm going to read you another passage to give you an illustration. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 22. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, means the child does not die, he shall surely be punished according to as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as, listen carefully, the judges determine. Now, you, most of the time, when you've heard the concept of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you think it's vengeance and street justice. But in every context where that phrase is found in the Old Testament under the Mosaic law, it is the standard by which the judges are supposed to make decisions. So in other words, if a person wrecks your brand new car, they're supposed to replace your brand new car. If a person destroys your cow, they're supposed to destroy, uh, replace your cow. If a person murders a neighbor, they forfeit their own life only after due process of the law. It talks about the judges in this passage. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, we have a similar passage, different subject, but similar passage. It's talking about witnesses. Verse 15, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priest, and listen carefully, the judges who serve in those days. And the judges shall make careful inquiry. That means they're having an investigation. And indeed, if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother... Then you shall do to him as though he would have done to his brother. So shall you put away evil from among you. And who and those who remain shall hear and fear. And, there, and hereafter they shall not again commit such evil, meaning to lie under oath. You, your eye shall not pity life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And the context again is for the judges to have an understanding of righteousness both for the stranger, the resident alien, and for the natural-born citizen. Then Matthew, we live in a very litigious society. So did they in the time of the Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, Jesus said, You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whosoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If any wants you... Uh, wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whosoever compels you to go with him a mile, go with him two miles. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow, if you do not turn away. The law at that time was, if you happen to be standing along and watching the parade as the Roman soldiers come by, and the Roman soldier says, carry my backpack a mile, you're supposed to carry his backpack for a mile. And then you say, tell you what, because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, because I love righteousness and I love truth and I love justice, I'm going to carry your backpack two miles. Because you can imagine the Roman soldiers, by the time they get there, the guy throws it down and takes off running. <laughs> but can you imagine the Roman soldier when the guy gets there and he says, tell you what, because God loves you, I'm going to carry your backpack another mile because I love God. And because God loves you, and I love God, I love you too. In other words, Jesus says we are not to be quick to jump to litigation against other people or go, my rights above all others. We're to remember that Jesus said the Son of Man came to what? Serve. Not to be served in that sense. He came to minister to others and to set an example. And we too are to do that. 
And so we see that in the eyes of God, judicially, and there was a lot of passages we didn't look at regarding religiously, men are held equally in the eyes of God. What about our sinfulness? Why, well, this one shouldn't be hard to demonstrate to all of us present. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is what? None righteous. No, not one. There is what? None that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have to, together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. You see the equality there? <laughs> we are all unrighteous in the eyes of God. And so in the sense that all men are created equal and all men have sinned in Adam whether you want to look at it from federal headship, that he's your, your representative, or whether you want to look at it as a seminal headship in the sense that he is your great, 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 great times who knows how many grandfather, we all sinned in Adam. And it says that we also are sinners because we sin, but we sin because primarily we are children of Adam. In, John, in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, Now we know that whatsoever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, what? That every mouth may be stopped. And that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We are all held accountable because of our sinfulness. And we have need of a Savior because we're all equal in the eyes of God. God doesn't love Americans more than he loves people from other countries. God does not love uh, Caucasians more than he loves people of other ethnicities. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Romans chapter 3 verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. And so in, in the eyes of God, all of us are sinners in need of a Savior. The whole world is sinful and born in sin. The whole world is born, is born on the broad road. And we need to proclaim them the narrow road by faith in Jesus Christ. Where Jesus said, I am the way. Not one of many ways. But I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, there again, that's, there's that equality. No man cometh in the Father but by me. In Romans 5, 12. Therefore, being, therefore, therefore just as though one man sin, entered in the world and death by sin. And so death, death passed upon all men. Why? For all has sinned. So you see that the need of salvation is equally across the board. So you and I never have to ask, or ask, do I need to share the gospel with that person? <laughs> Everybody's a candidate. Everybody's in need of a savior. We don't have to ask people, ask God, do, do you want me to witness that person? And we might need to ask God, how do you want me to witness that person? Or, or what's the best way to reach that person? Or what's the best way to, to, to befriend that person so I can witness that person? But we certainly do not have to ask God, do we need to witness to that person? Because all are in need of a Savior. All people are equal in the eyes of God regarding the gospel call. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, delivered from the bondage of sin, delivered from the penalty of sin, delivered from the power of sin, someday delivered from the very presence of sin. That's what it means to be saved. For with the heart... One believes unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, and listen to the universality here, as regarding the equality uh, for the gospel call, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed, as the King James says, or as others, put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God doesn't say, well, I'm sorry, you, you're, you're of that ethnicity group. Uh, you, you shouldn't even bother to call. I'm not even going to listen. That is not what God says. God says, for whosoever 
shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We have the universal invitation of God because all men are created equal in the image of God. Now, I know there's some more theological complications, but don't make it more complicated than God does, okay? God tells us all men need to be saved and all men can call. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, he's talking to Christians now. He's not talking to, to non-believers. He's talking to Christians. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Listen carefully. He's talking now to Christians. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And you are Christ, and then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So here's what we find out from this passage that he's writing to believers. The gospel transcends ethnic distinctions. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither Jew nor Greek. The gospel transcends economic differences. He says neither slave nor free. The gospel transcends biological genders. The Pharisees used to get up and say, God, I thank you I'm not a woman. They were arrogant. They were haughty. They were spiritual elitist. But God loves a woman just as much as he loves a man. And women are created in the image of God just as much as a man is created in the image of God. And it is Christianity, and what's happened is our history has been rewritten and our history, they leave out very important things now. But it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that has allowed women to prosper as much as they have in this nation. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ which allowed slavery to eventually end, both in Britain and here and in other parts of the world. It was Christians who were moving that forward because all men are created equal in the eyes of God. The gospel makes us one in Christ though we may have different ethnic heritage. The gospel makes us one in Christ, though we may have a different economic lifestyle. The gospel makes us one in Christ, though we may have a different social background or different biology. The gospel makes everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior an heir of God through Christ Jesus, verse 3 of that passage. And so, my friends, when you hear the words, and we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Please keep this in mind, that all people, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what shade of their skin, no matter what social stratus or anything else, all people deserve dignity and honor and value because they are created in the image and likeness of God. All people are, create, are equal in the eyes of God regarding the law. You don't have one standard for one group of people and one standard for another. Now, you've heard the term a lot about systemic racism. I don't have the time today to deal with that issue, but I will deal with it. Very, I'll give you one quick illustration. Are you aware that one of the political candidates helped pass the law that said if a person is arrested for holding X number of ounces of powdered cocaine versus X number of ounces of crack cocaine, that this person gets a longer prison term. And that person happens to be African Americans because crack cocaine was cheaper in that form in their community. That is not justice. That is inequality. That is injustice. Because cocaine is cocaine. Ice and water are still water. It's still H2O, whether it's frozen, a solid, or whether it's a liquid, or whether it's a vapor. It's still H2O. And so what we have to understand is that there are issues in our laws that some people have created with the idea that it will punish one group of our citizens more so than another. That has to be undone. But it has to be done legally. It has to be done righteously. And it cannot be done by burning down communities. And it cannot be done by murdering and looting innocent people that had nothing to do with any of this. 
And so we have to understand that all people are created equal in the eyes of God as regarding the law, and therefore our laws should do the same. People are equal in the eyes of God regarding their sinfulness and their need for a Savior. And we need to spread the glorious message that God loves sinners. And all people are equal in the eyes of God regarding the gospel call. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever will may come, the scriptures say. Help us to stand for justice. Help us to live out our creed that all men are created equal. Doesn't matter their skin tone. Doesn't matter their ethnicity. Doesn't matter their social status. Anytime you see a person, that person deserves dignity just as much as the person you love more than anybody else in this world. And that person deserves honor and, and equality just as much as the person you love most in this world. We, of Christians, we have to set the example if things are really going to change. Father, I pray that you'd help us to examine our own hearts, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would search our hearts. And Lord, if there's any wickedness, any racism in our hearts, that you would reveal that to us and help us, Lord, to uh, pray for our nation, to pray for our legislators, to deal with these inequitable, these laws that are inequitable. Help us, Lord, to understand that there are many out there who are hurting and they need our understanding, even though we don't agree with how they're proceeding, Lord, and how they're doing some of this. But we know, Lord, they have legitimate complaints and a just cause. We pray, Father, that you would help us to set godly examples and help us, Lord, to discern from the rhetoric of people versus the actions of people. For we know that we have that expression, actions speak louder than words. But sometimes, Lord, we're, we're, we're just drowned in all the noise. And help us, the Lord, to have discernment. Lord, we do pray that you'd help us, who are your people, to humble ourselves, to pray and to seek your face and to repent of our sins that you would indeed heal our land. Help us to turn from our wicked ways, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Andrew will come and lead us in our closing hymn, and he'll lead us in our closing prayer. Please stand and sing with me. God bless our native land. God bless our native land, for may it ever stand through storm and night. When the wild tempests rave, ruler of wind and wave, do thou our country save by thy great might. For her our prayer shall rise to God above the skies, on him we wait. Thou who art ever night, guarding with watchful eye, to thee aloud we cry, God save the state. Not for this land alone, but be God's mercy shown from shore to shore. And may the nation see that men should brothers be and form one family the wide world o'er. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we've looked at your word today about uh, our standing before you all as sinners in need of a Savior and our, our responsibility to witness and share that love with whoever they may be of any, of any creed, of any uh, ethnicity, of any, any skin tone, any national heritage, whatever it is. Lord, even some that are involved in sins that we would consider even more wicked than our own. It's all sin in your eyes, and we all need a Savior. It's very hard to be effective witnesses and to still hold uh, any kind of hatred or prejudice in our hearts. We know uh, Jonah uh, struggled with, with that issue, and, and he, I believe he may have missed a big part of the blessing of the work that you did uh, in 
his sharing of the message of repentance. So, Lord, help us not to fall into that trap of having hatred in our heart. Help us to be people that witness and, and, and share the gospel, the love of Jesus Christ, the same love and the same grace that was showed to us. Help us not to hold that back for any reason with anybody. We ask for your blessing as we go home. Keep us safe. And thank you for this time we've had in your house today, the first time back after many months of not being able to be here. Lord, we praise you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.